You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to exploring innovative minds and adding life to your years. And now, your host, scientist Ray Cronice. Welcome. This is going to be a real fun deviation from our normal subjects. We've been talking about nutrition and metabolism and taste and flavor. But today, we'll talk a little bit about computer technology, about art, history, and really get to the roots of how I did the work that I did that led to oxidative priority and metabolic winter hypothesis and pendulettes, weight loss. Tim Jennison is probably one of my five best friends in the world. He's that person that you would call when things aren't going well or that person that is always going to be there. We met 25 or 30 years ago and have been friends ever since. I can't begin to describe for you guys the kinds of adventures, but also the kind of intellectual boxing that I got to do with Tim. He's without a doubt one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And he's also an extremely humble person too. He's easy to learn from. And if you haven't seen Tim's Vermeer, you may even want to think about watching that movie before finishing this podcast. Not that I want to downscale this. We're not, not going to have any spoilers, but if you have seen Tim's Vermeer, you will know exactly who I'm talking about. And I get a little cameo appearance there. I was down when he started working on the room. I was down staying with him and we were working on another project as well. And was able to be part of that as it was rolling out real time. And we'll talk about that today. And I'm also hope to talk about this in the context of how I unraveled the things in metabolism and nutrition by simply going back at time and looking at books before we had the diagnosis or confirmation bias that we have today. So this will be a lot of fun. It's really great. It's fun to be able to have just a casual conversation with somebody that you're close to. So I know we'll probably take a lot of side tracks and side paths and maybe do some things that aren't typical for the people that are listening to this show. But hopefully we'll all expand out because I really want to get into where video was, and it'll make sense for those of you that have seen Tim's Vermeer, where computers were, what was out there before YouTube, how Tim was part of really putting together this next level in technology that all of us use today. So to give a little background of Tim Jennison beyond that, he revolutionized desktop video, his company, New Tech was able to do for a couple of thousand dollars what hundreds of thousands of dollars at the, in the day uh, couldn't do. He always stayed ahead of the technology. In other words, he designed programs and products for what technology would be in a certain period in the future, not what was available today. And often that led to products that were a little ahead of their time, meaning it created bugs and problems. But Always the technology would catch up, and he seemed to be ahead of the curve. But he is an incredible engineer. He's an incredible thinker. He's an incredible tinkerer. There's nothing Tim Jennison can't fix. So with that, I want to bring Tim on. Tim, welcome to Science and Saucery. So welcome, Tim, to Science and Saucery. It's great to finally get you on. <laughs> Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's going to be fun talking about this because we go back a long way. And a lot of the innovations that you've had over your career that are sort of important in the later work you've done really go back to the beginning. And since a lot of my audience 
may or may not even have been alive when New Tech started and the video toaster came out or the days of the Amiga computer. Can you go back just a minute and sort of talk about the video world and image processing and color space and computers in the, the mid 80s to late 80s and Digiview and just how that stuff came about and what it was like to edit and to do work with computers in photos and videos then? Well, when personal computers started out, they were black and white or, you know, maybe eight colors or something like that. The Mac was black and white and uh, right. you couldn't really get in there. You had to have a special screwdriver to open the computer. And then once you got in there, there was nothing you could do to it. The PC was expandable, but again, the, the graphics were real blocky and, you know, just a few colors. And uh, you, you know, the best you could do maybe with a computer would be to try to, um, you know, do text editing uh, for for uh, your uh, video production, you know, something other than actually handing, handling video because the computers just weren't fast enough or the resolution, the graphics weren't good enough to use in video. Well, I'm, I'm a filmmaker and I started as a child basically and played with the early video equipment. Uh, you know, I would tear apart uh, videotape decks and cameras and fix them and and uh, kind of learned how everything worked. And then, you know, the com personal computer came along and I go, well, can I do video with it? No, you can't. So it, it, the, the signal coming out of the back of a, a personal computer was not compatible with normal video. If you try to record on videotape, it just it would turn into a confetti on the screen. Then came the Amiga computer. And the Amiga computer would put out a, a, a perfect uh, video signal that could be recorded on a, on a VTR. Um, the computer still wasn't fast enough to input video, but it could output video. So the first thing I did uh, to get started on the Amiga was this uh, digitizer <laughs> called Digiview. And you would plug in a, a uh, you would plug in a video camera, black and white video camera. Right. And, um, and, and, point the camera at something and it would magically come into the computer. And then if you wanted color, it came with a little color wheel, red, green, and blue uh, transparent uh, filters that go over the, the video camera. And then you could get a color picture. And the first time I got it running, I stared at the screen and go, my God, this is coming out of a PC. Um, you know, you've never seen great graphics come out of a personal computer. Right. And uh, so I started working on it, getting it ready to, uh, to ship. Uh, and that was the start of uh, New Tech. And I gave a demo disc to a guy from Commodore Computer, which owned the Amiga, um, this guy named Jeff Bruett. And I, I met him at a, uh, at a little uh, demo they were doing of the Amiga computer in Kansas City. And I gave him this disc and he, he put it in the computer and he was really quiet. And basically this thing was displaying one picture after another that had come out of the digitizer in, in full color. And he just, you know, he was sort of gobsmacked, I guess, didn't say much. And he said, can I, um, can I, can I copy this disc? I said, yeah, but yeah, you can, but my phone number is in the text file. So don't give it to anybody else, okay? Okay. And then the phone started ringing off the hook. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, just everybody in the world was trying to call me and say, what is this thing and how do I get one? And that was the start of New Tech. And we sold a bajillion of those things. It was 200 bucks. It was one of the first uh, systems that would uh, put, you know, kind of broadcast quality pictures into the computer. Well, that was just act one. I really wanted to use the computer as a broadcast station. So I could plug in cameras and do switching and special effects and character generation. And it turns out that the Amiga still wasn't fast enough to process video, but I designed a board called the Video Toaster that would plug into the Amiga. And the, the board that plugged in had all sorts of high speed processing stuff on it. And it was controlled by the Amiga. And the Amiga also um, 
was used to um, to do character generation and stuff like that. And uh, this, uh, we started talking about this product in the late '80s uh, when we were well underway with development. Well, as often happens in development, uh, it slowed down. And we started throwing in the kitchen sink. You know, instead of this simple product, we decided to put everything. Paint feature program, creep. <laughs> yeah, feature creep is what it's called, exactly. And, um, you know, I think it was Steve Jobs who said, uh, perfect is the enemy of shipping or something like that. <laughs> and so, you know, normally you want to get something out the door. Well, we were doing okay uh, selling DigiViews. So that was the venture capital to, to fund the uh, development of the toaster. Well, the toaster finally shipped in 1990, and it was uh, number one with a bullet. Uh, everybody, you know, that wanted to do real uh, broadcast quality looking video uh, could uh, could add that now. You know, before that, they were using videotape machines, and you could just cut from one scene to another. You couldn't put graphics in. You couldn't put transitions. And uh, so these people with just two or three tape decks that were editing, all you could do was basically, um, you know, go from one shot to the next, nothing, nothing more than that. So with the toaster, now you could get the look of ESPN or NBC or whatever. And it included uh, a 3D animation system called Lightwave. And that let you uh, do kind of Toy Story-like stuff. And that was a real sleeper. At first, nobody used it because uh, you click on that 3D button on the video toaster screen and suddenly you're confronted with this thing that looks like, well, it looks like homework. You know, you got front, top, and side views and you got to draw shapes and enter numbers. Yeah, specularity, you got to learn all these terms. Well, a lot of people, after they explored the rest of the toaster, they come down to the 3D button, they go, oh, okay, I'll try it. And, uh, and, and then suddenly, uh, Lightwave 3D became a huge thing in Hollywood because the, the toaster system was so inexpensive compared to other 3D tools. Right. They would buy a toaster just to get the 3D uh, animation system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was a real uh, sea change in television. Let me layer a few things in here that were what the reality I was having because I was at NASA at that time. And I think this all happens at the same time. This is where you and I intersect by about the mid-90s. But at NASA, we were flying, back to that DigiView, we were flying a field sequential camera on Space Lab. And all the video, if you look at the old video of the day, it all looks kind of muddy and not very good. Well, the design that Tim is talking about with a red, green, and blue film in front of a black and white camera is exactly how the early shuttle cameras worked, except for that thing was spinning. And since it was spinning at one rate and it was taking the signal of a red signal, a green signal and a blue signal, and I think even a clear, I think there was actually four just like yours, there was a, a background. But anyway, it was taking that, transmitting those signals down and they were being reassembled into color TV. And it was a very inefficient way to do it because without going into too much detail, was sync. But when we tried to actually take off-the-shelf Sony camcorders and other things that video got pretty good by the, the 90s, and we still had crappy video coming down from Space Station, the stuff that we would get after the mission that was recorded on small handy cams looked amazing. And we're like, why can't we transmit this? And you couldn't interface it in the, in, in the signal, and or it doesn't really matter why for the moment, but... Part of the thing was there were these $8 million cameras, and we, you know, I've even proposed from an educational perspective, let's just, let's send triple or let's just t send 10 camcorders up. They're not all going to break and give them out to schools after every mission. You know, in fact, Tim and I were talking about this at that point in time, but, but video really was changing. And at NASA, I had one of these really incredible multi-million dollar studios and we had a video toaster in there as well uh, which is how I got familiar with this but what was really unfortunate is that you couldn't do this at home and when I saw this tape and if, if you've if you're out there listening and you, you're not familiar with video toaster and you don't know about it just go on YouTube and look for video toaster revolution 
It's the demo tape that they came out with. And one of the things that New Tech and Tim and the rest of the team there was great at was just marketing. You, you watch this thing and it was, it's hard to explain now how much that video moved people to want to do it, especially because editing really good video today is so trivial from a comparison perspective and from a technology perspective, from a cost perspective, or just from a user interface perspective. And there was this big gap where people couldn't make their own TV. In fact, Tim, in, in your video toaster manual, what was that quote about TV that you had? And I would think it was in the very first video toaster manual. Yeah, I think it was uh, in the next 10 years, your favorite show on television will be made by you or someone you know. Uh, you know, that was, uh, and that turned out to be the case. And, um, you know, I, now I know people that, well, I mean, I, I guess I know a lot of television people, but yeah. No, everybody listening right now. I mean, there's so many people doing their own shows on, on YouTube, et cetera. And I can say this with all honesty, you and I having had these conversations at the time, it's more prevalent and more common than we even believed at the time. Oh, yeah. YouTube was a concept in, in terms of we thought of distribution that wasn't a TV station or a cable station. We envisioned that for sure. But I don't think we could have ever imagined billions of views out there and all of these individual people and supporting themselves and making a living doing it. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It really and, is. You know, back then, there were three networks and and PBS, if you call right. that a network, and um, th that was that was your out that was your outlet for video, or you could s try to sell tapes, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Revolution tape, um, you know, this is long before uh, the internet. We wanted to get that video in front of people's eyeballs. At that time, the only advertising medium that really made much difference was magazines. You know, glossy color magazines, right? with names like videographer and and things like that. Video toaster and, user. <laughs> yeah, there was a... You had your own magazine, not user. you, but there, there was one out there. Yeah, Jim Plant did that. Yeah. And so we took out full-page ads in all these trade magazines and said, we will send you a free videotape demonstrating the video toaster. Well, this was unprecedented, basically. And, you know, because we were making so many tapes, they were 10 minutes each, we got the cost down to where it really wasn't all that expensive for us to give away video videotapes. And that back then, just having a free videotape, you know, was worth three or four bucks. We gave them away free. Right. You were the AOL of uh, VHS tapes. Yeah, they were sending out uh, discs. <laughs> yeah, so you could sign up for AOL, something like that. And uh, so we pulled out all the stops to uh, to make a really good tape. We got Ken Nordine, uh, the voiceover guy, to. Um, you know, he, he's the voice of Levi James. He sounds like God talking. And uh, you've heard his voice a million times. And uh, we got him to do the voiceover and the music for it. And uh, the, the tape just was instant uh, afterburner. Yeah, again, if you haven't seen it, just uh, search on YouTube for Video Toaster Revolution and watch it. And there's a couple versions. And another thing that happened at time, and this now starts to really intersect with my audience was your running across Penn Jillette, Penn and Teller, I think it's Saturday Night Live originally, and then you guys all becoming good friends. Yeah. Um, well, Brad Carvey was one of the engineers at New Tech, brother of Dana Carvey, the church lady in George W. Bush impression on, uh, on, uh, right. uh, on Saturday Night Live. And so... Um, yeah, uh, Dana took us took us in uh, and let us uh, get into Saturday Night Live and attend the after party and and um, after that, uh, the next day, we're hanging out at Dana's apartment in New York City. Like, uh, I think we'll go see a show. What do you recommend? And and Dana said, Well, I've, I've never seen the actual show, but Penn and Teller have a show, and it's it's a hot ticket. I work with them on Saturday Night Live, but like I say, I haven't seen the show. Well, we went, we all went to the show, a bunch of new techers. We came back raving about it. And Dana said, wow, you really did like it. You know, we would recite entire skits out of, from memory that we'd heard, we'd seen the night before. And uh, 
So Dana said, well, would you like to meet him? Sure. So he arranged for us to get together and uh, we, we hit it off. Um, you know, we had so much in common and just stayed in touch over the years, done a lot of projects together, uh, culminating with um, this um, uh, documentary film that we, we made uh, a few years back, uh, right. Tim's premiere. Yeah, and it's been great. And that's really, you know, we, we get to know each other because I got a video toaster eventually. And then you were interested in space and I was interested in video and you had some new projects you were working on on digital video. And we flew together on NASA's KC-135 back in the, the, in vomit, the vomit comet. comet days, right? You know, and yeah. had your first time in zero G. Right. But one night we were, we were working on a... Uh, a model. This is the crazy stuff Tim and I would do along the way. I would come there, he would come here, and we would just work on crazy projects. We're working on a a theme park motion based simulator, <laughs> and we built it all out of a fishing string line and poles and pulleys. I think eventually you built a a version of this in the in the warehouse too. But yeah, you had asked me. He said, "Have Have you ever seen Penn and Teller?" I said, "No, I haven't." He said, "You want to?" And you picked out your phone. You called Penn. And we jumped in your 421 and we flew to Wolf Trap. And that was the very first time I met them and saw them. And we all hit it off because of the zero G side too and, and loving technical stuff. And it's just a really strange coincidence of events that all those years later when, when Penn was sort of like on death's door with, with, his, with his diet and he asked me to help him. So, but we became friends because of that trip and all of us would sort of hang out and talk about that kind of stuff. We would, it was kind of a geeky group of really neat, smart people that all loved to innovate in, in ways that were both artistic and also technical. And this sort of brings us to really Tim's Vermeer. I know there's a lot of other background detail that happened in between there. And to include, I'll, I know that on, I think it was December 23rd, 1998, maybe it was 1999, maybe it was 1999, no, it was probably 1999, I don't know. Tim and I were on his plane coming back from shooting a bunch of video and doing the test flights for Zero G, the, the weightless company that I started with Peter Diamandis and... Byron Lichtenberg and Tim and I built the original accelerometer for the pilots to use. And we were coming back. We had done a bunch of aerial flights, uh, in flights, uh, flying next to a 727 with a with a Cessna 421. And that was kind of interesting times yeah, we were so doing. But giant jetliner and little two two engine uh, eight seater uh, flying right along beside it. We were flying for me. The 727 is barely hanging, going slow enough to stay in the air. And we're saying, you know, can you just, can you point the nose up a little bit? We, we, we really um, need to get a better video or better picture or video shot of this. And it's like, you know, two things you don't want to do is fly low and slow. And you certainly don't want to put, point the nose up. For those aviation people out there, you'll understand that joke. But Right. So we're flying close to the ground because uh, the videographer wanted to get the mountains in the background. So Yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't really <laughs> want to do that as a pilot. No, you don't. But we did it. Right. Anyway, we're coming back and suddenly start having all these things going on. Uh, on on the plane, and and we were also with Bob Williams, who had been the director of operations for the KC-135 uh, for 25 years. So he was an aviation guy. I was getting my pilot's license. All, I was you know pretty much finished, other than final tests. And then, of course, Tim was a seasoned pilot, helicopter pilot, twin engine pilot. And suddenly, all those simulator things came true. We were having issues, and we ended up landing i think it was in pecos we did an emergency landing in pecos texas isn't that where we ended up yeah yeah and nobody was there the there there wasn't anybody manning the, the the landing gear caught on fire as we were landing and it became this whole sort of ordeal so we we've had those kinds of interesting sort of adventure adventures along the way boy the good old days i know <laughs> but Engine fires yeah but back to this idea of all of this coming together with tim's vermeer and fast forwarding a little bit, I remember at that time coming down to San Antonio and we were hanging out for a week and you're talking about, I've been working on this project and first you were going to just do some YouTube video on it right. and pick up that story and talk a little bit about how Tim's Vermeer came about. 
Well, I got interested in uh, optics from the 17th century and if painters were using optics to paint pictures, because right in there, this incredible realism suddenly shows up in painting, the Dutch Golden Age. And uh, before that, a little Golden Age in Italian art. My daughter bought me a book about this topic, and I read it and got interested. And I actually looked at some of the Vermeers and uh, these other paintings and started to research it. And I go, wow, it really, were they, were they using lenses and stuff? And how were they using it? Nobody knew. Nobody knew how they did it. They knew that the optical tools were around for the first time and that art got more realistic, but nobody could really explain how that happened. And the, the thinking was that they would use something called a camera obscura, which in Latin means dark room or dark chamber, and uh, have a lens project an outdoor scene onto the opposite wall in the room. And it, it works. Uh, you see this upside down view. It's not very bright of whatever is outside the uh, outside uh, coming through the lens. And, but if you try, you can, you can tr actually trace shapes on that projection. It's kind of like running a video projector, except it's really dim. And yeah, you can take a piece of paper and you can trace around things. But what you can't do is paint on it. Uh, it seems like it should work. So you got this nice full color projection and it's moving, you know, because the outside is moving. And if you try to paint on it, let's say you've got an apple out there in front of the lens. Well, you see this red apple on the screen. So you try to mix up some red paint and you try to match the color and you put it right on the right on the paper where the apple is and you just can't do it. It turns very dark and very much more red because that paint essentially is being lit by red light from that lens. That's why you see a red apple on the screen. So it works against you. It doesn't help at all and unless you're just trying to trace shapes. So I was thinking about this in, in, in the bathtub. This idea came to me that you could use a mirror to actually compare the color of the projection with the color of the paint on your canvas. And if you could compare them, you could paint the screen of a camera obscura and you could get essentially a, a human made photograph. And let's add here that other artists slash historians like David Hockney had established that was a book I think you were talking about, Vermeer's Camera, had established that they could detect in the photographs, evidence of lenses or evidence of the kinds of aberrations you would think might come about if someone's using a lens. And an overarching thing in terms of even criticism for the movie and criticism for all this idea is that somehow if we use technology or if we're trying to use or imagine someone in the past used technology that they were thinking ahead of the curve, that somehow that didn't make it art. And yet you come from a family, even though you weren't an artist from a, just a, a, a painter, uh, Leslie, your wife, your children. I mean, you have a, you come from lots of art and you were doing obviously computer art. You were doing, you're an amazing musician. So this idea that somehow technology and art have to be segregated is one of the things that seems to be sort of missing, or I think seems to be an assumption. And what you were trying to do with this technique is to say, I think they might have been ahead of their time. Yeah, You weren't trying to take away from any Vermeer's brilliance. I mean, he'd be even more brilliant if he learned to do this, but somehow people somehow think technology is cheating. Yeah. It's this ivory tower attitude that separates art and technology. And, and it's a modern point of view. It, it, it really has never, uh, in the 17th century, they wouldn't have thought that way. They, artists didn't think of themselves as uh, great uh, creative geniuses. They, they were in the same trade union as the guys that painted houses. And it was considered a craft. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't have had that attitude. But there was, uh, there was a lot of secrecy back then. Right. And artists today are secretive about uh, their use of photography because it's considered to be kind of cheating. Um, you don't really talk about it. You know, uh, um, you'll find, um, I actually asked a lot of painters and I just kept, kept track 
Um, do you use photography? Oh, yes, I, I do as a reference, they would typically say. Um, what does that mean? Well, you know, I'll take a, a lot of pictures with my camera and then I'll look at them and then I'll go paint, you know, so there's not a real connection. Well, a lot of them are actually tracing the photographs as, as a start. Norman Rockwell talked about this in his book, uh, Rockwell on Rockwell. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, I use a projector. I, I, I'm not proud of it. I don't talk about it, but it just saves so much time. You know, and Norman Rockwell's uh, illustrations, uh, you know, just look like handmade photographs. Well, at the time, in Vermeer's time, in the 17th century, uh, mid-1600s, there, there was a lot written about the camera obscura uh, in art, art theory. And, um, you know, uh, like this guy, uh, Samuel Hochstraten, wrote a, a manual on painting, and he said, well, you should look at the camera obscura. You'll learn so much and uh, try to emulate the look of it. And, and then going back uh, even before that to the, to the uh, 16th century, uh, Della Porta said, uh, all you have to do is set up this lens and then lay the colors in. You know, he, he didn't know about this problem. He just right. thought it would work. So the four or five people saying, yeah, use the camera obscura in the 16th and 17th century, but nobody is documented as actually doing it. So there's a, all these people talking about doing it, but no documentation that anybody actually did which is suspect. Maybe mm -hmm. they were doing it and just not talking about it because it would right. be a real uh, advantage over your competitors, you know, and if, especially in Holland at that time, there were so many painters and they were all competing with each other. And for the first time, there was a, a retail art market. Before that, it, the church had been financing all the art, all the painters. Right. Well, the Dutch decided to kick out the church, the iconoclasts, and they, they tore down tore down the statues and, and paintings from the churches, even the stained glass windows sometimes. And they sort of banned organ music. You know, it was a kind of a real back to basics thing. And so all the, uh, all the painters had to go, uh, you know, make money somewhere else. And, and in the 17th century, there's something like 5 million artworks uh, created in Holland. Uh, but that includes um, some black and white etchings and things like that too, but just an explosion of, of painting. So I thought, yeah, pretty likely that at least one of these guys was using optics. And Vermeer seems to be a prime suspect. And this is all circumstantial evidence. There's no right. documentation they did this. And that's what the art historians today, that's their best argument. Well, somebody would have written something if this happened. You know, it's like right. a YouTube or it didn't happen. But there was no internet then. There weren't even, no any, uh, weren't even any newspapers. Right. And this trade secret idea, the idea that it's, we're not talking about they were not doing it out of shame. They were doing it because they wanted a competitive advantage. It's like not handing out the Coke recipe. It, it wasn't necessarily something that was anti-art the way people try to project on it now. No, it wasn't like they're guilty and, and trying to hide it. It's just right. that's the way, that's, that was the uh, attitude at the time. You, you had to join the guild, study with a master for six years and then you could belong to the the guild and then you could sell pictures you couldn't even right. sign a picture if you weren't in in the guild so these uh these apprentices had to and, and we have contracts between the apprentices and the masters and the contract will typically say um my son is going to study under you i'm going to pay you this much in return you have to teach him all the trade secrets they don't specify what they are because they're mm -hmm. secret, but uh, they're stuff, you know, they, they were doing something. So, yeah, I, I just thought uh, that uh, if there was a way to copy the screen of a camera obscura, which I knew was impossible, the, the, the easy way, right? Uh, with this mirror, you can actually do it. And there's an interesting parallel here with going from the black and white computers to various colors in terms of colored depth and perception, but that until you really see a camera obscura or an image or later a photograph, your eyes don't see what's there. So this idea of copying a photograph or, or looking at a photograph, I, I don't want to call it cheating, but just having a referenced material is important because our eyes simply just don't work that way. Yeah, this is a, a point that we made in the film that um, our eyes are 
kind of lying to us. And optical illusions show you this. For example, the, the checker shadow illusion. There's a, a picture of a kind of a checkerboard. You're looking at it uh, down at an angle, and there's a big green cylinder over on the right side sitting on the uh, checkerboard casting a shadow. And so you see these black and white squares. You can, you can Google this, the checker shadow illusion by Ted Adelson. And um, two of the squares are labeled A and B. And one of them looks black and one of them looks white because your eye is sort of saying, okay, there's a shadow there. So it's really not as dark as, uh, as all that. Um, anyway, it turns out A and B are exactly the same shade of gray and you just can't see it. Even after I mm -hmm. tell you that, you can't see it. The only thing you can do is, um, you know, like cut two holes in a piece of paper so you can see square A and square B and sure enough, they're exactly the same shade. So right. it's called, uh, well, there's a, a lot of uh, effects going on in our vision. It's very, very complex. Uh, uh, color constancy and brightness constancy um, and lateral inhibition. This is something that happens right in the retina of the eye. So the realistic light and shade never makes it to the brain. It's, it's compressed out before it goes down the optic nerve. The stuff going down the optic nerve, you would not recognize it as an image if you could look at the actual bits going through those nerve cells. It's just a bunch of flickering, uh, flashing little synapses happening. And there's nothing that corresponds to the actual brightness. It's all about what, what, uh, what is next, what's the area around this, and is there a contrast with the area around it? So that's um, the absolute brightness never gets to the brain. And the brain and the visual cortex reconstructs all this and you know it's a wonderful thing the first thing the brain tries to do is tell you what you're looking at you have to be able to recognize everything that that are in front of your eyeballs if we don't recognize something when we open our eyes we work really hard to figure it out real quick because that's what we needed to survive we needed to see food and we needed to see uh, uh, people that were or other predators that were trying to eat us mm -hmm. so it is extremely complex, and we started to learn about how complex it is when uh, when we tried to use computers and computer vision, robotic vision. Everybody thought that would be pretty easy. How hard can it be to figure out, um, you know, what what's coming down this video line? We got a computer here. Well, computers still are having trouble doing this. They 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 can't really do it. It's so complex. But this argument, no painter will believe me. They go, I can see just fine. I will be able to paint that. Um, where where our eyes really fall down is when there's a, like a big white wall, and there's different illumination. So it may be bright on the left side and dark on the on the right side. This is you find this a lot in the Vermeers. In the actual room, if you were in the room, the wall you, basically looks white. Our brain is telling us this is a white thing, a big flat white thing even though it goes from almost pure white to pure black down in the shadows, our brain says white. Well, artists say, yeah, I know that, but I've learned how to get around that. I just squint and then I can see everything. Well, if you squint at the optical illusion I was talking about, it doesn't help. You know, it, it still looks like two, two very different uh, colors and it's the same color. So that's, uh, that's one thing in the movie that, um, people just scratch their heads. What's he talking about? And we had a, a vision scientist, uh, Colin Blakemore, and he said, uh, yeah, the vision is, uh, you know, there's this very complicated process. And in that process, we lose the ability to sense absolute brightness. It just, it's not there. And I'll take this in another direction, because if you think about this idea that our eyes are cameras and they're transmitting images, versus what you just described, which our eyes are collecting information and your brain is constructing the image. And I want to give people a, a visceral understanding of this in a slightly different way uh, in working with hundreds and hundreds of clients. And you probably have all experienced this firsthand. If you see a photograph taken of you that someone else posts and you look and you think, oh, wow, my face looks fat or, oh, look at my hair or well, you know, something, some imperfection, again, what Tim is explaining is your brain is naturally going to look for the deviation it sees in the view. 
And since you see a two-dimensional self in the mirror all the time, or selfie face, this is why everybody ends up with that same angle. If you're seeing that all the time, and then now you see a point of view, and you didn't control taking that picture, you believe that you look different. But to everybody else, it just looks like you. They don't see what you see. It doesn't look like, well, that picture makes me look fat or bad hair day. If you go to the salon and these experts, these are people that you trust to cut your hair and to style your hair and they know what they're doing. And when you say, oh, my hair is doing this, that's just your perception because you're seeing something. And of course, with all the clients that lose a lot of weight, in fact, Penn was really surprised by this because he said it wasn't going to make that difference. And when he got to a weight where people weren't recognizing him, it started actually with Glenn and everybody to say, well, wait a minute, what are we doing here? You know, what's what's happening? Because they didn't really know what was going on. Even he was impacted and infected, and he said he wouldn't be. And I think this underscores because when we're looking at people, we're really seeing their volume. You don't see their weight. You see their volume. And what people strive to do is not to get to a certain weight because it doesn't matter. They want to get to a certain volume. A bodybuilder wants certain muscles to have larger volume and others to be areas to be smaller volume, to have a right shape. And so it's a complex set of things that's about self. And if you go in the mirror, and we have clients do this all the time, and you take a photograph with your phone when you're looking in the mirror. So you're looking in the mirror, and instead of looking at the screen, actually look at your, your phone in the mirror and take a picture. If you look at the image you just took and look in the mirror, you'll see, see two different images. It's the craziest thing because, again, like Tim is describing here, our brains are trying to describe a world. And in that description he was talking about, all these other physiological things that are going on are also these psychosociological things that are going on, our view of self and who we think we are. And this is where the self-esteem stuff all gets pushed all into here. And it becomes really complex in such that a lot of the clients that get to their normal weight can't even tell they've lost weight. And I think like in an extreme version of this, it would be like anorexia nervosa or, or something like that. But everybody experiences this to a degree. And does that make sense, Tim, in terms yeah. of how our mind is trying to interpret the world? And back in the day when we were doing Huff transforms to do edge detection on crystals, that was something a project you and I worked on mm -hmm. at NASA to try to look at a crystal face growth rate. These were just really elementarily simple processes that were, that were looking for edges. And to go into something so complex like what Tim is describing, it gives you humility about how much we don't know about it, and how complicated it really is. It is, it is mind-boggling. But our eyes do have these edge detectors built in. They know that now. Um, and it was uh, uh, Hubel and, and Wiesel that won a Nobel Prize. They had a cat wired up. They had electrodes in the cat's brain. And they were, they were showing visual stuff to the cat. And they were looking for some, you know, connection. We see these electrical signals, but what do they mean? So first they go, is it brightness? No, has nothing to do with brightness. You can change the brightness. It doesn't do anything. Then they start to put shapes on the screen. And yeah, now it's kind of going off like a low-level Geiger counter. You know, some signals coming through. And, and uh, as they're, they're using a slide projector, or a, actually an overhead projector, and they're slipping in these uh, transparencies one at a time to see if the cat would respond. Well, they were doing this, and they changed pictures one day, and the cat's brain, this electrode just went crazy. And they said, what was that? Well, now it's stopped. What's going on? So they took the slide out again, and the thing goes crazy, and then stops as soon as the slide stops moving. Well, what it was, was this line at the edge of the slide. That's what was firing uh, like crazy. And then they realized that they're kind of like six different angles that all fire a different uh, nerve cell. And nobody knew that about cats. And it turns out it's true of all primates. Uh, that's one of the layers of information is this edge detection. Um, and we tend to see edges. You know, when, when you ask somebody to draw a picture, they start drawing lines. Well, those lines don't exist. 
Right. There's a contour between that color and that color, and it's got a shape. But we have no problem. We, we watch The Simpsons, and we go, yeah, okay, that's Homer Simpson. It's nothing but lines, you know. And um, so anyway, to make a long story longer, uh, I decided to, to paint a Vermeer with this technique. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not a painter. Uh, I took art in high school, but I never did any oil painting or anything like that. And I just applied the rules. You know, I said, I'm going to go across this uh, with the mirror and I'm going to match uh, what's coming through the optics as closely as I can. That's my rule. I'm not going to try to paint like Vermeer or like anybody else because I'm not, I'm not capable of that. And when I was finished, uh, you know, six, seven months later, here's this picture that by golly looks like a Vermeer. You know, it's, it's very, very similar to, um, to the, the painting called The Music Lesson. So I'd set up this room to, with the same furniture as uh, Vermeer's uh, painting. But I'm not looking at the picture. I'm, I'm looking through the optics and just matching the colors as well as I can. And it was not pleasant. Inch by inch by inch. And when, he, when Tim says, if you haven't seen the documentary Tim's Vermeer, you'll have to watch that and then come back to this because what he just glossed over was that Tim used that package Lightwave 3D that he was discussing earlier that New Tech was producing, and he modeled every single object to the nth detail in that room and created an exact reproduction of this room. Yeah, there are these funky window frames uh, that they had in Holland back then that have kind of this scalped, scalloped out shape. So I modeled all that in, in Lightwave until it matched the painting, and then I put it into the CNC milling machine and, uh, and cut out that wood. And then uh, there's these lion, lion's heads on the, on the tops of the chair. Yep. And uh, I found those, that type of chair in a museum in Holland and took pictures from every angle. And then I could make a model of the, of the lion and then have the CNC milling machine carve it out. So I made that chair. Um, I made the uh, harpsichord. Uh, fortunately, there's a guy in, in uh, Edinburgh uh, that had that's an expert on these harpsichords. It's a, a type of thing called a virginal, uh, I guess, because virgins played them a lot, and um, you know, young women. And they had these decorations on them, and he'd he'd uh, basically copied all these decoration papers that were printed, block printed. So what I built was something that has got to be extremely similar to what Vermeer was actually looking at. So what else? There was a rug, a Turkish rug, uh, that's written in the foreground of the picture. And we actually found the right rug. Uh, Farley Ziegler, the producer of the, of the, of the film, she, uh, she wore out a lot of shoe leather, uh, you know, chasing down these things. And she found a rug expert. And uh, he said, well, this is a Turkish Ushak medallion rug, very specific. I know exactly what the patterns are. I haven't seen one for quite a while. And um, you pr I, I may know a collector that has one. I don't know. I'll ask around. Well, he never did. He said, but by the way, the real expert on that type of rug is in Holland, and you should talk to him. So we talked to this guy, uh, a guy named Idema. And he was a lawyer who just loved rugs for some reason. He said, okay, yes. That is a uh, Turkish Ushak medallion, and it's also the same rug used in this Vermeer and that Vermeer. Then uh, one day Farley got a call, and uh, sh they, uh, this collector said, um, you won't believe this, but that almost exactly that same rug has just come up for sale at Christie's. And it, it'll probably go cheap because it's too big to hang on the wall, and it's too valuable to put on the floor. So this type of rug really doesn't fetch big prices. And we got it for the minimum reserve bid. And uh, so we had that rug, you know, exactly what Vermeer was looking at. Uh, it's 500 years old. Uh, we had pottery made by a, a potter in... Del yeah, there's like a vase or a water? Yeah, it's a wine jug. Uh, so all these things went into the room, and then I just sat there day after day and, and copied now, I, you know, I wasn't working the same way Vermeer did. Vermeer was working very fast. You can tell his brush strokes are very sure and, and, and um, deliberate. He was an artist. Yeah. I mean, he painted. He was a painter. Fantastic painter. And, and this becomes a big criticism a lot of people have out there as if you're trying to d demonstrate 
uh, th- this sort of this this talent, and and that's not the point at all. The point is, if Vermeer used this tool, he still made all the compositions, he still did all the strokes, and he obviously was way more efficient than you because it, right. <laughs> it took you a long time to do that one painting. You know, that was a long, long experiment. Yeah, the funny thing though is that uh, Vermeer worked very slowly as well. You know, he had a big family, uh, which may explain part of it. But he turned out a painting on average every six months, which is really, really low. Rembrandt, just up the street in uh, Amsterdam, was turning out over a thousand pictures in his painting career. Vermeer, we have like 35 of them. So he did work extremely slowly and very deliberately. And he was not a rich man. He died penniless. Um, But each painting was quite valuable. Like one of his paintings, was recorded as selling for, I think, 600 guilders. And what does that mean? Well, for, for double that, 1,200 guilders, you could actually buy a house in Holland. So half a house is what this painting sold for. So if, if it was worth as much as a house, you might want to, you know, go to the, all the trouble that somebody would do building a house, you know, use the technology, use, um, use uh, whatever you can. And, and you're talking about computer graphics, there is so much complexity there, and, and we're just trying to use every tool possible to get the most beautiful, realistic image on the screen, you know, like Toy Story or just all the computer graphics that are in, in movies now. Uh, you know, they're trying to fool the eye into believing you're looking at the real thing, and that's what the Dutch said they were trying to do. They said, we're trying to fool the eye, and if you build it, something magical will happen. And they would sometimes put curtains in front of the uh, in, in front of the painting uh, to protect it from light, I guess, but also and dust. But also, they would just go over and pull the curtain aside once in a while and watch the painting, you know, like the way we'd watch uh, watch TV or the internet for a while. And they would just stare at it, and you know, it was a different world. And imagery like that was was a great luxury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's really fascinating, and having been there and also there's a moment and there's I have a photograph of this moment which is great when I was I was at the house and you had these stacks of all these Vermeer books and I was working on the problem I was working on of course Tim helped me a lot we were talking about thermodynamics we were talking about body cooling this is the when the right cold stuff was going on just by you know chilling yourself to death in the middle of the right yeah we were doing calculations back the envelope and I was I was down there helping with the first parts of this room, building this room and, and looking at this and just being fascinated that, that without being a painter, just the things he had done of his father, the one, the painting that he made of his father or father-in-law, which one was? Yeah, it was my father-in-law, his high school graduation right. picture. And I, that was one of my first experiments. Right. And, and so anyway, we, in talking about this, the, the degree of research that Tim did to go back to say, what can we know? I had done a similar thing in a completely different industry in the pool and spa industry on the history of pool drains and codes and standard safety kit uh, codes for for swimming pools, but not obviously not to the same degree of what, what Tim had done with this, but I was doing this nutrition and metabolism work and I'm thinking, well, I could go back and look and say, what did people think about metabolism? What did people think about nutrition? And what's really interesting, and I know Tim got to, you got to experience this firsthand, and maybe someone who's never done this before can't really feel what it's like, but when you know how the story ends, and then you go back in the beginning and read it in order how it rolls out, a new picture emerges that sometimes even experts in the field never see because they only have time for a digested version Mm of the past because what's relevant in the present is more significant in their education. Am am I saying that correct? We see this happen in science a lot in other fields uh, where an outsider will come in with a fresh, fresh perspective. And yeah, that literature uh, out there, you can, yeah, you can Google this, uh, whatever subject you're interested in. Google doesn't have all the books and the journal articles that form the backbone of any field. Um, those are either just in printed books or they're, you know, paywalled on the internet. Uh, so 
you know, in a, in a, in a technical field like that, if you want to go back and dig deep, you'll, you'll see things that other people haven't seen. And, um, so yeah, I had to buy a lot of books. A lot yeah, of me old too. Books. I, I discovered eight books from you and Teller. You guys were the one that turned me on and I started buying up all these books. And, and the interesting thing is, is that things like fasting, which I used to be able to find dozens and dozens of books on, now they're all bought up. You can't, you can't find some of these original books I have going back to the 18th century. Uh, and that's as far as I went back to seven, my oldest book is like 1740. But you can't find a lot of these books anymore because suddenly it became a thing and people just started buying them up and libraries are dumping, dumping them everywhere. Reading yeah, they'll University. Put them, in, put them in a landfill, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're dumping all these old books as being irrelevant. And fortunately, that Google Book Project has captured a lot of them. But yeah. it's as you know this feeling firsthand when you're holding a book that's 273 years, years old and you know it's that old and you're reading it and you're just amazed at just the production of the book, how complicated it was to produce it. And there is just a connection I think you have and an attention frame. And then again, you know how the story ends. And even though there are explanations for things, especially in metabolism and nutrition, weren't correct, their observations were actually better because they didn't have any diagnosis bias or they didn't have modern diagnosis bias, I should say. They didn't know how it worked. So yeah. their observations and their data is some of the best things that you can find. And then when you can take that and then walk out in my case, I, did, I wasn't painting a picture. I was looking at metabolism. When I could reproduce some of Lavoisier's experiments to within 5 to 10% error of what he got with my own midlife crisis calorimeter out my metabolic lab in my garage, it makes it real. You say, okay, he did this in 1790, and I'm doing it in, in this point in 2012. And I'm getting largely the same answer. So there has to be some consistency here. And in some sense, that's what you did with Tim Vermeer. I mean, that's what you did in the documentary. Well, Tim Vermeer was kind of science and kind of not. You know, Karl Popper was the great philosopher of science. And he, he missed the boat a few times. Basically, he said, if you're going to put forward a hypothesis and it can't be either falsified or verified then it's not science, it's pseudoscience. And you know, the goal of science is to overcome our cognitive biases, everybody's got them, um, and, and uh, try to get to the truth uh, beyond your belief. Uh, and confirmation bias is one of the worst, where you mm -hmm. tend to read things that support what you already thought. My friend Carl says, uh, yeah, I just read about confirmation bias and now I'm seeing it everywhere. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's the problem. Um, and you get into these scientific fields where somebody has got a history of writing this or that, and they just don't want to, um, don't, don't want that to go away. You know, there, it's part of them. There was a, I can't remember the, the name of the scientist who, who had studied, uh, studied the uh, variations in the intensity of stars. And he thought that it was uh, that he discovered a planet or something uh, around this star mm -hmm. and presented the data and wrote a paper. And then he was asked to present the paper at a, at a symposium. And he got it in front of the audience. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've gone back and looked at my data and found that there was a, uh, an instrumentation artifact. And I'm going to have to retract my entire paper. It's, it's just wrong. And he got a standing ovation. Yeah. Because that's that's what science is. Yeah. And I, you know, Carl Sagan, there's a really great quote by Carl Sagan. Uh, one of the saddest lessons in history is this. If, if we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're, we're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. Mm. It's simply too bamboozle. painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you've given a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. And I think that's a really interesting twist on, diagno on diagnosis bias or confirmation bias in that it's not just the idea of seeing that familiar, it's also the idea of uh, 
a lot of people being fearful of being wrong about something. You know, when when Joseph Black uh, in the day got the the evidence from uh, Lavoisier about the idea that phlogiston wasn't real and that there was this thing called oxygen. Just paraphrasing a bit, he said, "When you know, I first got this this letter from you, I was repugnant and in doing this because I've been teaching this incorrectly for like thirty years." Your data is so compelling that I am a force to accept your new system. And he says in the letter, and I'm paraphrasing all this loosely, even though the older scientists probably will never accept this, my younger students are already doing dissertations using your data and your system, and they're having phenomenal results. And this was really the discovery of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Priestley at the time, who was really trying to prove the existence of the the phlogiston theory— he, his experiments were the ones that Lavoisier used to prove the existence of oxygen. And just that little bit, the idea of being afraid to be wrong, and this is another reason I think that you or me or other people outside the field, we don't have a vested interest at that moment in the outcome because we haven't really been pushing that thing. And then we have this curiosity and we ask questions that would be obvious answers to anybody who had studied the way it's being presented today. Mm. And sometimes it's the simple twist of that question that makes a completely different idea. Like you back going all the way back with the video toaster was you took a computer that out of economy had it generated a signal that you could hook up to a TV because a monitor was an expensive thing and everybody had a TV. Right? That's really what it comes down to. Well, the machine and was because... designed to be a video game, too, which is the real reason it had a, a compatible signal. But, yeah, you're right. But, but the idea is that twist in that allowed you to use some newer technology and, and grab that signal along the way and do these in- interesting things. What was the TV show that, was, that we used to laugh about that used all the trans- transitions? Was it Home Improvement? Yeah, Home Improvement did, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but these people, we would laugh back in the day because we would see it everywhere back to, you know, once you knew the 300 and however many transitions that the video toaster had, you'd start seeing it everywhere because you're looking for it. Again, right. this is another concept of what happens when you're learning. And, and so, you know, bringing it back to this point, uh, testing a hypothesis, it, it's going to be always impossible to know, did Vermeer actually do this unless some document turns up some, right. somewhere? And it may, but when you watch the documentary and you look at what Tim has pulled off, it, it's at least possible. And there is a, there's a couple of other ones, and we'll leave that, I guess, for people to see some of the, the fun stuff, uh, the things that you detected along the way, the smile, and a couple of other things so they can watch it real time and not be too much of a spoiler alert. But I think, you know, this is really... It's, it's, there's a lot of new discovery out there and now people can, everyday people can be scientists. Uh, it was Feynman that had the whole citizen scientist book. Everyday people, you don't have to be part of an institution to do it. I'm collaborating with people at major institutions and they don't care that I don't have an MD or a PhD. It doesn't matter. They care that it's good ideas and they're, you know, testable hypotheses. And I think that that is an age and the same thing with video. You used to have to have a permission or audio with music, you had a permission from a, a distribution Gate network keeper. before you could be an artist. Yep. Well, my favorite Feynman quote, uh, since you brought it up, about science, he says, science science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. And <laughs> that uh, that kind of sums it up. And he, he was a very down-to-earth scientist. You know, he was, right. he was in the Manhattan Project, you know, designing... Uh, nuclear reactors and stuff, but my right. um, pen was calling him up, asking him algebra qu- a question so just to, <laughs> in our lifetime. When I remember, yeah. I was thinking, oh my gosh, because I met him that one time at Marshall Space Flight Center associated with the Challenger stuff. And later, pen at the after the fact that we were all together, pen was just calling him up, asking him everyday questions. I'm thinking, I just really want to meet him one time and have a significant conversation if Penn was right. just doing these crazy things. So Yeah, Penn and well, the charmed life. He can do that sort of thing. He really does. So well well one more thing. So do you have anything on the horizon or any super secret squirrel kinds of ideas or next generations of of what you may be doing that 
do you, you're ready to talk about any or is there? Well, for fun, I'm doing, I'm getting back to my roots. Uh, before I was into video, I was into audio. So I'm building a, a vintage recording studio here with all vacuum tube equipment, old stuff, uh, you know, which goes back to the 1920s and 1930s. So that's, that's my fun release. But yeah, after uh, Tim's Vermeer came out, um, I, I didn't touch a paintbrush for at least a year. I just detested it. And uh, then one Christmas, the, the three daughters were home, and I asked Claire, would you let me do one more test? I want to try to paint with no lenses, just, just a mirror. And uh, she said, all right. And so I told Penn I was going to do this, and he said, well, you know, you have, you have to have a camera. Camera's running. I said, all right. And uh, I painted Claire in the manner of uh, Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring using nothing but a flat mirror. And that kicked off a whole nother chapter of this crazy story. Um, I got a call from uh, David Walsh. And I had to Google David Walsh. Uh, he, he sent me an email and said, I'd like to discuss this with you. David Walsh is a billionaire uh, made his billions gambling on horses. And he decided to sort of pay back the world for being a leech. He would build this incredible art museum in Tasmania where, where he was born. And he said, I'd like to do an exhibit based on your film. He said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that you're right, but surely you, you, you just did one painting and I said, well, I've done two. He said, well, surely you'd want to do more. And, and he said, I'd like to hire painters and non-painters to come into the museum. It'll, they'll be on exhibit. They're, they'll be performance art in their own right. But we'll try all these different techniques, whatever you want to do. And so that exhibit ran three years. I spent a lot of time in Tasmania. As part of it, I went to Delft, Holland, and moved in uh, for six or seven months and painted... Uh, uh, recreated a Vermeer there called View of Delft. And so here's all... Oh, I remember you talking about that. That's great. That That's the one that looks across the water. Yeah, the water's in the foreground. It's called the Kolk. A lot of people think it's a sea, but it's it's actually just a little widened canal, an inland port. And um, it looks like a color photograph. And everybody, you know, uh, uh, Marcel Proust said, it's the most beautiful painting ever made. And... Um, it hangs there in, uh, in The Hague, uh, just up the street from Delft, where Vermeer lived. And um, so after Tim's Vermeer came out, there were the, these internet trolls that would get on and say, well, Tim's wrong because you could never paint view of Delft with this technique. Therefore, if Vermeer didn't always use optics, but he painted perfectly without, uh, then Tim's probably wrong. Okay, and I follow that logic to some degree, but I go, you could paint view of Delft. No, you couldn't because the clouds are always moving, the water's moving, the boats are moving, people are walking around, the seasons change, the angle of the sun changes. And I go, yeah, but that's that's not a killer problem. You know, if somebody out there painting with an easel would have this, see the same changes. Yeah, but you're doing it with this mirror and that wouldn't work. So as part of the exhibit in uh, Tasmania, uh, we got permission from the, the city government of Delft to build this two-story structure, temporary structure in the city park that is called View of Delft Square, or Pl mm -hmm. Delftsicht in, uh, in Dutch. And uh, I moved in and started painting. And again, I'd never painted a cloud. I'd never painted water. Um, but I just worked my way through it and ended up with a picture. And, you know, it's not a great picture, but it's, uh, uh, it, you know, it resembles the Vermeer very closely, the things that are still there today. There are not that many things, but there's two churches that are still visible. There's a military building that's visible in the center of the picture. And those things, uh, everything lined up perfectly. All the sizes and shapes of everything line up uh, with, with Vermeer's. I had to do a lot of research to figure out if that was the case because these art historians said, oh, no, Vermeer was changing everything. He, he changed the perspective. He stretched things out to be more horizontal, whatever that means. Um, and so this is, not, this is just an illusion. Well, I went and did the homework, found the old maps, figured out what these buildings were, and 
they all and there's people that have actually done a lot of history already even on this because i remember seeing a documentary when we first started talking about this shortly after where someone had gone in and confirmed even down to the floors of the of the buildings of that like there's a like a warehouse or there's something that was there and they they went to a lot of people have gone to a lot of detail yeah for me uh, in that, area. that out for some reason everybody wants to figure out how did he do it well why are they trying to, why don't they do that to every painter? Well, because there's something about Vermeer. You just yes. got to try to figure it out. It, and it, he really is an out. And when you see the view of Dell, really, that one even more than the one you did the first time, is it looks photographic in an eerie way. Yeah. And the details, but because it, you're so far away from the subject and the details are there, the parts that he captures... It just seems improbable to me, but I'm not an artist either. So, I, you know, what do I know about this? I'm just saying as a lay person looking at it, it seems improbable to me that someone would pick out all of those tiny little details. It, it's back to this, what does your eye really see in terms of shadowing and there's just reflections. It, it is a beautiful picture just because the amount of detail that's in it and it, it does, especially if you if you Google it and see the icon image of it, it could easily pass as a, photo, a photograph. Yeah, yeah it's, it's creepy. And with my research, I discovered that all this perspective and the shapes and the angles of all these buildings were correct. Well, there's only two ways t to explain that. It's very unlikely that you would uh, just be able to sketch it just by standing there and looking at it. Uh, we're, we're not that accurate. This is within millimeters of where it should be. So Vermeer could have started with a surveyed map of Delft, reconstructed every building mathematically, kind of like computer 3D rendering. He could have applied the rules of perspective to get the various vanishing points. Each building's got a slightly different angle, so a different vanishing mm -hmm. point. But it happens automatically with optics. And they talk about Occam's razor. Gee, you're, you're mm -hmm. postulating this very complicated thing that Vermeer did. That's not the simplest explanation. So Occam's razor says, all things being equal, the simplest explanation is the best. But Einstein had a sort of a twist on that. He said, yeah, um, things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler than that. So if it doesn't right. explain the data, you got to go back and, and make it more complicated. So I think Occam's razor would say that the most likely explanation, the simplest explanation is that Vermeer had a camera obscura and this, uh, this comparator mirror process. Right. It's great. Well, that is a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's off the well-beaten track of nutrition and metabolism and flavor and taste and some of the things we've talked about weight loss, but it is, it is the reason I did this research. This is the inspiration for my project. You were the person that every phase of my life from leaving NASA to zero G to you know, video production to the, the health stuff, all of that, I have to thank you publicly because without you as a friend, without you constantly driving and us having these kinds of conversations for hours and hours and hours and hours, uh, and flying all over the world and just doing all kinds of fun projects together. I, there's no way I could have taken Occam's razor uh, to weight loss. And the, I know it sounds obvious that in the absence of food, your body uses your energy storage organ. It doesn't use your muscle tissue and your heart and your skin and your retina or your brain. It actually just uses your body fat. Uh, that seems simple, but everybody believes that somehow you have to compare the calories in and the calories out on a given day. You don't do that on your bank account. You don't write checks based on how much you deposit in a day. It's an arbitrary comparison. And really that's what we're talking about, both with this technique, with color comparison, with what we're doing in science, comparing the old and the new. It, it's always about comparison and, and how you ask that question can change dramatically the answer you get. And so this, again, with science, this is, you know, Einstein's spooky action at a distance, if you think about back to another side of him, which is the act of measuring the pot with your finger in it, 
changes the measurement itself. And, and I know that's crazy quantum mechanic stuff, but it, I, I've been wrapping this all up. Tim, I can't thank you enough for A, a being a, an amazing friend over the years, but B, this intellectual insatiable curiosity that you have. It's just such a great treat to be able to do this and, and be able to experience some of this stuff first time. So can we expect that there's going to be a view of Delph sequel to Tim's Vermeer? Well, Farley, the producer, Farley Ziegler, um, I dumped all this material in her lap and she's been helping me shoot it for the last several years. She wants to make an eight part miniseries and they're starting to edit it now. I'm sure it'll take a long time uh, to finish. But uh, it's so gratifying to hear you uh, say that, Ray, and, and uh, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm obsessing over uh, something that happened uh, 400 years ago that means absolutely nothing, basically. It won't change anything in the world. And what you're doing is really helping people, saving their lives. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's neat to be uh, some small part of that. Oh, you're a big part of it, believe me. And, and we've got a lot more thing, fun things ahead of us. Uh, hopefully we both uh, take advantage of this longevity health span stuff and live uh, a lot longer to do a lot more fun things. So. Well, they say, uh, they say carpe diem, which means God is a fish. I, I think that's what it means, <laughs> carpe, carpe diem, diem, yeah. My Latin is getting rusty. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for thank joining you, us today. All right. That was a lot of fun. Go watch Tim's Vermeer, Food for Your Mind. Thank you for joining me on this plant-based path to good health. It's always the food for your mind and body, so keep eating right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucer. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. Welcome to the first day.